Hello everyone. My name's Ross Anderson. We work with the Cedar Grove congregation. That's in Lower South Fulton. Our church is in the Pine Woods outside a little town called Fairburn between there and Palmetto. But we are thankful the relationship we have with the Woodstock church family. We have lots of friends there. We have particularly been blessed. We have become very close to the Jeremy Powell family. Many of you know that our granddaughter, Ellie, unexpectedly took sick and passed away earlier this year. And Anna Powell and Ellie were in the same class at school. They were very good friends. Anna was a great blessing to Ellie and to all of us while she was in the hospital. Their entire family has been very supportive and helpful. In fact, many from the Woodstock Church family have blessed us with sympathy, with notes, with encouragement and support. It has been a tremendous power, the blessing the Lord has sent us to have folk helping us to make it through that very difficult, painful time. So we thank you for that. And we are thankful for that relationship that we enjoy. And we are thankful to consider a portion of the scripture this evening. I read a story a while back. A Russian gentleman named Ivan, he was on his first trip to Moscow. He wanted to go to the Moscow Zoo, and so he joined a group that was being directed by a tour guide. They wound up in front of a cage, big giant Russian bear, and in the same cage, little small, tiny, helpless lamb. Now the tour guide turned around and with a triumphant smile said, now this is what we call peaceful coexistence. But when he saw Ivan shaking his head in doubt and disbelief, he finally admitted, of course, we do have to put in a fresh lamb every morning. There are some things that just can't coexist. Oil and water, Apple and Microsoft, a fork and an electric outlet, and spiritually, light and dark, morality and immorality, dark sinfulness and the light of righteousness. Good and evil, they don't mix. In today's passage, Galatians 5.19, we learn that another one of those mutually exclusive, can't coexist items, the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. Now, in the book of Galatians, we find there is a big idea that permeates the entire book that overrides all of the other details, and that is that we come to God or we are accepted by God on the basis of faith in Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean faith only. It doesn't mean faith alone. It means that we come through the provisions God has made we have faith in Christ and we do not try to come to him through the works of law keeping. Specifically, we do not have to try to come to God or be accepted by God on the basis of keeping the law of Moses or any other legalistic system of law keeping. Galatians 5.1 then says, you have freedom. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. And that is specified. We are free from keeping the law of Moses and all of its ritual ceremonial demands. We are free from trying to chalk up all the points of a legalistic system to reach God. We come to God because in his grace, he has reached out to us. Jesus has come to earth. He lived, died, was crucified, buried, and raised again in power. When we respond to the good news of that message and follow the directions that are involved in the proclamation of the gospel, we are responding in faith. That means that we have freedom, and we're also free, for example, from circumcision, as a religious ritual. And as we go on through Galatians 5, it's clear 
that the apostle wants us to understand, we also have freedom for. We have freedom from and freedom for. A few days ago on Memorial Day, someone sent me a quote that's quite memorable. Our freedom does not mean free to do as we please. It means free to do what's right. <coughs> and that is the emphasis in Galatians 5. Our freedom leads us to life in Christ and fruit that is developed by the Spirit. It also leads us to reject and to battle and to fight against the works of the flesh to deny sin and to avoid the unrighteousness involved in those actions. So we find there is an explanation of life in the spirit and the apostle also wants to expound on the works of the flesh. Do you read Am Landers? Sometimes you take it for whatever it's worth, but once in a while, there is a nugget that you can take home. One time, a woman wrote to Ann Landers and she said, Dear Ann Landers, do all men cheat on their wives? I've been suspicious of my husband for some time. I even hired a private detective, but he couldn't find out anything definite. So I went to a lawyer and the lawyer said, you might as well grow up. You ought to understand that all men fool around and just accept it. Is that true? With perception, the answer came back saying, no, that is not true. There are many men who are honest. They have integrity. They are faithful to their vows and they're loyal to their wives. Your husband may very, very well be one of them. But one thing you can just about be certain and that is that your lawyer is cheating on his wife. Well, cheating on one's wife is identified as adultery, and that headlines the works of the flesh. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, and lewdness. Now, those first two words get a lot of attention. There is a great deal of overlap between adultery and fornication. There are a lot of similarities. In fact, some of the Bible translations actually put them together under one expression, sexual immorality. But I like to be a little bit more specific than that. I like to really nail it down. And I think the best way to describe those two words is simply unmarried sex. Any kind of sexual activity, any kind of sex that is not in a marriage relationship. We have young people that come in. Sometimes they're getting ready to plan a wedding. Sometimes they want to have some advice. Sometimes I ask them to take advice in preparation for their marriage. And sometimes it comes out that they've been playing house for six months, a year, or whatever. They're usually shocked when I tell them the Bible identifies unmarried sexual activity, pre-marriage sex as sinful behavior. Why they said, we wouldn't want to get married without trying it out, see if we're compatible with each other. So then they're really shocked when I tell them that not only the scriptures say that, but the statistics, all of the research indicates that our chances for successful marriage don't go up by living together beforehand. Our chances of success actually go downhill by participating in living together before marriage. Well, sometimes even the younger group, sometimes kids that are just early in their teenage years, uh, they will sometimes um, they'll find out in their family and they'll want to come in and talk about it. And they've been having sexual relations. They don't like it when I use the word, you have been experimenting with sex. Oh no, you don't understand. We've already gone all the way. But I say the word experiment because they haven't gone all the way. They've done the sexual act, but they haven't even gone halfway, not part way. They haven't done anything the way God intended. It's a little bit like a Mississippi flood. 
when the river's in its channel, it's powerful, it's productive, it's helpful. But when that water gets out on flood stage, it's as destructive as it can be. And the same thing is true for our sexual behavior. When the Almighty created everything that he made, and he put human beings in the Garden of Eden, he pronounced that it was very good, and that included sex. He wanted us to realize everything is for our good and our benefit. That sexual behavior bonds, it unites. It is a powerful glue that holds man and woman together in marriage, but it is intended to be in the channel of marriage. Outside marriage, it becomes very destructive. Not only all of the physical ailments and the diseases and the unwanted pregnancy that we hear about, but the guilt and the remorse and the emotional consequences that come out as well. So the headline comments from the work of the flesh are adultery and fornication, but that's followed right up by two more words called lewdness and uncleanness. And you just almost get the impression when you say those two words, that there's something unsavory, that there is something unwholesome, that there is something that is a problem in conduct described by unclean and lascivious. Maybe to get an idea of what this is about, it would be well for us to look at some other Bible passages. Those same concepts are used, for example, in Romans 13, 13. We belong to the day, so we must live decent lives for all to see. Don't participate in the darkness of wild parties and drunkenness or sexual promiscuity and immoral living or in quarreling and je jealousy, promiscuous behavior, immoral living, anything that gets around right on the edge of unwanted sexual behavior. That's the emphasis in Romans 13. Another list of sinful behavior is found in Ephesians 4.17. You must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They're darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of ignorance that is due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they've given themselves over to sensuality and indulge in every kind of impurity. They're full of greed. They have given themselves over to every kind of impurity. William Barclay in his commentary says that this word lewdness means they are so far given to excessive behavior that they don't care what anybody thinks. They're just indifferent and callous. There is no rule. There is nothing to rein them in. Their behavior just goes beyond all boundaries. The dictionary gives us the word unchaste handling of men and women, males and females, or indecent body movements. Are you starting to get the picture? I didn't see this year's Super Bowl, and I certainly didn't see the halftime show. But from all the articles that I read, and all the news about it, and all the publicity, I'm pretty sure that the halftime show involved indecent body movements. I'm pretty sure that that's a pretty good description of this word in the scripture. Now, the old fashioned word coming from the King James Bible is lasciviousness. And a kind of a catch all word several of the translations use is sensuality. That is, it appeals to our sensual desire. And for uncleanness, sometimes it's called lustful impurity. You see how they work together? Uh, the wrong kind of wanting, that's what lust is, and the wrong kind of behavior, it's anything, everything leading up to the act of sex. So that's what we get. Eugene Peterson has a paraphrase, and sometimes it has a way of putting words into plain language to help us get the idea. The message paraphrase says this about Galatians 5.19. It's obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. 
repetitive, loveless, cheap sex, a stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage, frenzied, joyless, grab for happiness, trinket gods, magic show, religion, loveless, cheap sex, and an accumulation of mental and emotional garbage. In other words, what we put in our minds comes out in the form of sinful behavior. In our culture, we find all kinds of illustrations of lewdness, lasciviousness, sensuality, stinking piles of mental garbage. Did you know the motion picture industry, Hollywood turns out about 600 films every year. And of course, we don't hear about a lot of them, but 600 films. The pornography industry turns out about 13,000 films. There's enough money in that lascivious, lewd industry to make more money than NBA, NFL, and Major League Baseball all combined. I read about it that the pornographic websites were saying during our shutdown, during the time in which everybody was shelter in place lockdown, you can have free membership. That's because they know very well once our minds get turned in a direction, once our thinking becomes warped with lewdness and lasciviousness, it won't be a problem for them to reel us in. We'll be hook, line, and sinker caught on that sinful track. I don't think it's very hard for us to understand then these concepts and the kind of behavior the kinds of things that lead up to what we are talking about in terms of unclean and lascivious. The uncleanness is the opposite of purity. It was used in scriptural times. The infection that would come out if there is a wound or an injury and the corruption that comes out, well, that's the impurity. Or sometimes it's opposite. To be clean has the idea of becoming ceremonially clean. A priest or a worshiper wants to come to God, he must be clean. Therefore, he must not be impure or unclean. So, as we are the spiritual priests, those who come before the Almighty, we are the ones who want to make sure we are not participating in the impurity, the uncleanness, the lewd, sensual, lascivious acts. I don't think it's too hard then to visualize exactly what we're talking about and what falls into that category. I think we might do well to think about how to avoid some of those traps, to keep those hooks out of our heart. I think we would do well to think about what is the prevention. And two or three things come to my mind. The first one is to talk, to have the conversation, to talk with our young people, to have a conversation with our youngsters in our own home. You know, the schools a lot of times have sex education courses, and there is some benefit in that. They have a lot to tell us about human anatomy, physiology. They have some things to tell us uh, about uh, safety and prevention, but they never go far enough. It's very, very rare that the school sex education courses will take us far enough to the real key to dealing with sexual problems in our youngsters or in our own lives. And that, of course, is abstinence. That is the one method that is successful every single time it's tried. You talk about the problem of sexually transmitted diseases. You talk about unwanted pregnancy. You talk about um, guilt or emotional problems with respect to unmarried sex. The answer to each one of those is abstinence works every time it's tried. 
Well, it needs to be that this is an opportunity. And sometimes these conversations are hard to start. Maybe the classes at school become a starting point, but we need to have that conversation and we need to be open with the youngsters. We need to explain to them about the benefits and about the purity of sexual relations in marriage. We need to explain to them about the boundaries before and outside of marriage. So talking about it is a starting place. And I think that it's important to do that because number two, we should guard our hearts. We are instructed in Proverbs 4 to be very careful, guard our hearts because from it flow the issues of life or every aspect that is the wellspring, the well-being of life. Everything comes out of the heart. And you know that Jesus emphasized that too. This is the seventh chapter of Mark, beginning in verse 20. It isn't what goes into a person by way of food that defiles him. It's what comes out of a person that defiles him. It is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness. There's our word envy, slander, arrogance, folly. The ideas of sexual sins, along with all those other issues and lasciviousness come because our hearts have been turned in that direction and it leads to unwanted sexual behavior. Sometimes we have young people that come in, um, maybe they're both Christians, maybe they've both been raised in church, but they've been dating, they become very close, and now all of a sudden there's a problem. Maybe there's a baby on the way, and they maybe are emotional about that. And sometimes they'll make the statement, I just don't know what we were thinking. I don't argue with them. We give them compassion, we give them direction, we try to help them through it. But the truth is, I do know what they were thinking. I know that when I participate in entertainment. We go to the movies, for example. A lot of the times, not every single movie, I know that, but a lot of times the R-rated movies. Here you have people flinging off their clothes, in and out of bed, no consequences. And when you see enough movies about that, then what are you thinking about? You are thinking about the same kind of behavior. When we are listening to music, that make any difference which genre or which style of music you prefer. A lot of them have similar themes. And when we're listening to music that repetitively emphasize, it's okay to go ahead, it's okay to go ahead and do it, it's okay to gratify the sexual desires right now, go for it, grab it. Then all of a sudden we find that is forefront in our minds. Always, our behavior follows the dominant thought of our mind. Everything about our action is determined by our attitude, what we're thinking about. And that's why it is so important to guard the heart by putting up the barriers, the parameters, the boundaries in our hearts. Then we are able to avoid those situations because it is the lascivious situation, the inappropriate handling of men and women, young boys and girls, that then leads to the unwanted sexual action. So first talk about it, then guard it. I think also our focus ought to be on the Lord Jesus and the kingdom. The well-known Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. That is our focus, our direction, what's uppermost in our minds. That's a difficult turn to make, uh, especially at younger ages in life. That's a difficult turn, but it's so important for us to think in terms of what's best. How can I best submit to the Lord? How can I best serve him? How can I use my life that honors him that glorifies him and not merely gratifies my own personal desire. When I get to the point where I can focus on the kingdom, 
then I will be much more successful at putting down some of the desires that lead us into the unwanted direction. When we talk about adultery and fornication, when we talk about uncleanness and lewd, lascivious thinking and behavior, those aren't the unforgivable sins. Those all fall in the category that are covered by the blood of Jesus. Just like every other condition of human behavior, those are actions the Almighty is aware, Jesus knows, and he has given his life in order to redeem and reclaim us, to keep us out of those sinful behaviors and redeem us and make us profitable for him. For those of us who are Christians, the first step, of course, is confession. I just agree with the Almighty that this kind of thinking and this kind of behavior is sinful. I don't try to rationalize it. I don't try to blame other people for it. I don't try to put it off on um, the upbringing that was too strict. I don't try to get away from it. I just agree that this behavior is sinful behavior. And that leads to repentance, a change of heart that leads me to change my life. It's a 180 degree change. That is, it doesn't mean I'm trying to be more discreet. It doesn't mean I'm trying not to get caught. It means I put a stop to sinful behavior and I make it my point to serve the Almighty. So repentance, and forgiveness comes through redemption by Jesus' blood, which is the forgiveness of sins, according to Ephesians 1, 7. Jesus' life was given so that we would understand he and the Almighty Father understand everything about our lives and our weakness, and they know what's best. He identifies with us, including our sexual temptations. His atoning death, his burial, and powerful resurrection have put the stamp of approval that the message of Jesus is how we come to God. We receive redemption. We receive forgiveness. We begin anew. Whatever's in the past, whatever lines have been crossed by our sexual behavior or our in, and our erring thinking, Whatever boundaries have been blurred, whatever ways we have made mistakes, errors, sins, this is an opportunity to begin again because Jesus is in the beginning again business. It is a fresh start, a new beginning. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Jesus makes everything new. He gives us an opportunity to start writing a new chapter in our lives. And so uh, that's the opportunity we have to identify these concepts as sinful works of the flesh, but not merely to identify them, to turn, to change, to make our lives headed in the direction that honors the Lord Jesus, that makes our light a shining reflection of him, that allows us to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, not according to the culture and conformity of this world, Romans 12, 2, but according to the direction of God's word, that we become molded, shaped, transformed, fashioned into the image of the Lord Jesus to be made more and more like him. That's our challenge today, I think, and we want to pray about it right now. Lord, we give thanks and praise. The power of your word identifies sinful behavior, and we want to shun, avoid, stay away. We acknowledge wrongdoing, error. We acknowledge that we have blurred the lines. We acknowledge that our lives do not measure up. We beg you to intervene, enter in, to make us new, to cleanse us by the blood of Jesus, that you will transform our hearts 
so that we will be nearer to his image and we will more nearly seek the rightness of your kingdom. We look to Jesus, we bow down before his cross, and we hold on to Jesus, our rock and hope for eternity. That is our prayer in his name. Amen. Thank you, everyone. This has been a wonderful opportunity. We are grateful for the invitation, thankful for the time that we have shared, and we appreciate your sharing the time with us.